Hey everybody, my name is Timothy Hansen. I'm a visual effects supervisor in Los Angeles, California, and I'm also the founder of the tutorial website maxdepth.tv. And I'd like to thank Capturing Reality and CG Society for hosting this webinar today and for asking me to be a part of it. And basically what we're going to talk about today is photogrammetry, specifically photogrammetry with reality capture. And I'm going to cover a number of topics. I'm going to try and not motor mouth and talk super fast like I have a tendency to do. Um, but we're going to talk about why photogrammetry and specifically why photogrammetry with reality capture, the dollars and cents of it all. Then I'm going to give you five tips for photographing images specifically with photogrammetry in mind. And then we're going to do a walkthrough in reality capture where I'm going to show you how to use the software, how to take images that you've taken and run through an actual project. Um, so starting it off, why photogrammetry? Well, let's say that you have to have an accurate recreation, a one-to-one -one representation of a structure or an asset. And uh, before you even start you know, your project, you have to get this asset. So traditionally what you would do is you would bring in a modeler and then a textured look dev artist, spend a bunch of time creating the asset, uh, and, and let's think about the time and money that it would take to do that. So say you bring in a modeler and you have him or her you know, model for say two weeks, roughly 10 man days to make this model. And then once that model is done, you gotta bring in a texture artist, look dev artist, and have he or she texture that, look dev that, and get that thing set up in, in a finished asset. So all in for this photoreal asset, you need 20 man days, basically a month's time. And then if you break that out into dollars and what the cost of that would be, say in Los Angeles, a typical freelancer's rate would be $500 for the day. Um, and so then you multiply that by 20 days, you're looking at about 10 grand for this, this one asset, which is, you know, it's not crazy. That's within the ballpark of a typical asset on a project from film or a television show or a game asset. Um, but let's look at the time. It took 20 man days and $10,000. Now, the uh, architectural structure that I'm going to show you today that I used for a project that I had about three, four months ago, it took me four days. And it is a one-to-one -one photo accurate down to the gum on the floor uh, recreation of this location. And you can't get better than that. You can't get better than perfect textures exactly where they were down to the millimeter. There's always a little bit of human error, um, but photogrammetry will give you an accurate one-to-one -one recreation. So four days versus 20 days. And that four days using that same math, say $500 a day for a freelancer, that's going to be about $2,000. So you're looking at a cost of $2,000 using photogrammetry for a perfect asset or $10,000 in 20 days uh, doing it traditionally. That's a big difference in terms of dollars and time. So making that even more sweet, let's say you keep that 20 man days that you had you can get five assets in the time it took you to make one. Uh, and that's a huge time and cost savings, especially when, say, your project or your game has like 20 assets that it needs or, you know, location, structures, things like that. So that, that money and that time is just going to compound the, the further and further you go. So that's why photogrammetry, especially if it's not like a rigged animating asset, if it's like a set piece or a location, uh, photogrammetry is the way to go. It's totally a time and a dollars and cents cost savings. So that's why I would suggest uh, using reality capture for photogrammetry because when it comes down to just dollar bills, they're a great way to go. Um, so now that we've talked about why photogrammetry and why reality capture, uh, let's talk about five tips that I will give to anybody when it comes uh, to capturing imagery for photogrammetry. So the first one, um, when you think about imagery, when you think about film or photography, things like that, you think about typically these beautiful cinematic images, tons of depth of field, bokeh, really smooth, beautiful images. That's not what you want for photogrammetry. For photogrammetry, you want to shoot at a high f-stop to eliminate as much depth of field as possible. Depth of field is your enemy when it comes to photogrammetry. Because if you think about it, 
you're giving the software as many clean and clear features to solve with as possible. And if 90% of your image is super soft, the software is not going to have those things to solve with. So you want to shoot at a high f-stop, super clean, no noise. Uh, you want to think kind of the opposite of what you would do normally if you're shooting a film, but you're not shooting a film, you're shooting for photogrammetry. So you want clean, sharp images. And I'm going to show you a, a, an example here of one image that was shot at f16 or f18 and then another image that was shot at f3.5 and we'll show you the difference in terms of depth of field and sharpness and explain exactly why uh, you want to shoot like this for photogrammetry. So let's take a look at that. So looking here at this example we have uh, two images. One at an f-stop of 3.5 and another at an f-stop of f18. And you'll notice right away in the f3.5 version you can see that there's lots of depth of field out here things go very soft um, and blurry as we get further away from the focal point but then if i switch over here to the f18 version you can see all these leaves are now sharp it goes off into the distance everything is completely in focus and this is what you really want you don't want this the soft depth of field version you want to shoot with a high f-stop and get everything in this image to be perfectly clear so that uh, reality capture has enough to work with okay so that was tip number one uh, now let's go on to tip number two the second thing that i would suggest for people to think about in terms of photography for photogrammetry is your lighting now you want to have clean evenly lit images to use as your base uh, before you go in to reality capture. Now, um, the best time of day to capture, if you have control over you know, when and where you can shoot, uh, I would shoot in the morning. Early mornings, uh, right before sunrise and right as the sun is coming up are the best times to shoot, um, you know, by and large, for a number of factors. One, early in the morning, everybody's asleep. There's not going to be a bunch of looky-loos getting into your image or saying, hey, what are you doing with that drone? You know, that kind of stuff. Get rid of those looky-loos, shoot in the morning while everybody's still asleep. Uh, the other reason why it's good to shoot early in the morning is it gives you super even flat lighting. Shadows are your enemy. Shadow shadows and depth of field are the two worst things for photography, for photogrammetry. So you want to shoot early in the morning, even diffuse lighting. That's the best thing. Uh, the other thing that is great is, you know, when I look outside and I see an overcast uh, day, I get excited because I know that there's gonna be no shadows on the ground, no shadows anywhere. That's the kind of time of day that you wanna take those types of images. Golden hour, super harsh, contrasty, you know, directional lighting, you don't want any of that. Because what's gonna happen is, if you think about it, the images that you take for your photogrammetry, you're going to use later on to pull your textures. So you don't want those shadows and that extra lighting baked into your textures because then when you go to light your scene, if you need your key light to be coming from this direction, but the key light was coming from over there when you took the image, now your shadows are going in, in opposite directions and your image is going to look weird. Um, so you want to have as evenly lit a uh, subject as possible. So lighting, think about it, no shadows, no baked in lighting. Uh, the third tip I would give you is to shoot with consistent lensing. Don't go crazy on a zoom lens and half your images are 24 millimeter, the other half are at 100 or 85. You want to stay consistent. That way you give the software the best uh, you know, starting point to, to do the solve. If it doesn't have to calculate for all these, you know, I'm zoomed in, I'm zoomed out, it's going to give you a better solve, a quicker solve, and a higher, a higher resolution solve. So especially, too, if you're using drone imagery, um, I use a, a Mavic 2 Pro, and that has a fixed lens 28 millimeter. So I know when I'm shooting with my drone, I'm setting my DSLR also to 28 millimeters. That way, they're in perfect harmony, and it helps the software when it's going to solve later on. So keep your lensing consistent, 
And if you can, I would cheat more so towards the wider lens, like the 24, 28 millimeter. Um, it, you're going to get more in your image, and the more you can get in the frame, the better it is for reality capture to solve. And uh, also, too, I would tilt that camera to the side. You want more image top to bottom than you do side to side, because you'll get that coverage side to side as you walk around and get your images. Shoot vertical. It's better. Um, so then the fourth thing, which is really one of the most important things, is parallax. Parallax, parallax, parallax. That is how the software works. Basically, if you think about it, you want to take images from every possible angle of your subject. That way the software can solve for every possible angle on your subject. And doing it this way, you'll have less holes in your mesh, your texture pulls are going to be much cleaner, much uh, you know, higher resolution. And in addition to just doing concentric circles around your subject, you want to hit it from multiple angles. You don't want to shoot everything from the same vantage point. I would, like I said, I use a drone. So I throw the drone up in the air and I get down on it like that. Or I'll get up on a ladder, walk around, do what I can. Get from a high vantage point, then shoot straight on, and then also get down low get under it, shoot up at it as much as you can. You want to cover that object from every conceivable angle. That way, there's no holes in your mesh. A stronger point cloud is going to give you a better, more contiguous mesh. So again, shoot, shoot, shoot. If you think you have enough images, you don't. Shoot more. Get back out there and take some more pictures. A really great data set for something especially as complex as this model we're going to look at today I took 1,500 images, a combination of about three to 400 drone images, and then another thousand or more uh, from the DSLR down on the ground. Uh, as high a resolution images as you can get, and as many images as you can get, and from as many angles as possible, you want to completely capture that object or that subject from every conceivable angle, right? Um, and then the last tip, uh, really, that I would do is it's all about cleaning those images before you take it into reality capture. So what I suggest is to use Lightroom. Uh, you can use Photoshop, but Lightroom has better tools specifically for this type of uh, de-lighting, as I would call it, um, before you get into reality capture. So what you want to do, is you want to go into Lightroom, and you want to calculate for lens distortion. You want to remove as much of the barrel distortion of the lens as you can. Uh, and then once you've solved for the barrel distortion on the lens, then you want to go in and you want to kill as many shadows as possible and highlights. You want a flat, evenly lit image with, uh, you know, your white balance evened out. You don't want to have too much saturation one way or another because that's just going to go into your textures. So flat and even, no shadows, no super hot highlights, calculate for your lens distortion. That's going to give you the best image. Uh, to take into reality capture and have the best success. And so you want to make a macro, uh, color correct for one of your images, and then run that across the whole set. You want every image to look exactly like the one before it and the one after it. Again, to give you consistent color uh, for texturing and solving later on. So that's pretty much it before we roll into this uh, walkthrough in reality capture. Um, it's cost effective. It's time effective and, uh, you know, five tips. No depth of field, even lighting, consistent lensing, lots of parallax, lots of images, and clean up your images before you start your reality capture session. So let's jump in. All right, so let's get started with an actual walkthrough on how to use reality capture. Um, and what we're going to go over is the steps that it takes to make uh, an amazing structure like this recreated from nothing but just photography. No modeling, no texturing involved, um, out of the gate with this, this guy right here. First thing you want to do is you want to come to this workflow tab, and this is really where everything starts with Reality Capture. Basically, this is where you're going to import all of your imagery. And now there are some automated processes over here where basically, you know, if you bring in your images and then just hit start, It'll do exactly what it says here is it'll create a complete 3D model with the texture and you know, you'll be good out the gate. 
But with an, a structure like this, it's far too complex to just be able to, to use the automated process. You're going to need to know how to manually manipulate things and use a process to create an object that's as detailed as this. You're not going to be able to rely on just using the start, the start function. That's great for like simpler objects. But something that's more advanced, more you know, complex like this, you're going to have to do it manually. So let's begin that process. First thing we want to do is we want to come over here to this input. And this is going to bring in our, our images, our, the things that we've taken, and it's going to load them in to this images tab right here. But so the first thing you do, and so you can go to the place that you've stored all your images, and uh, I have quite a few. Actually, there's about 1,450 images. And you want to just go ahead, click select all, and hit open. And then what that's going to do is it's going to bring all your images into this tab here where you'll see images. Let's drop that down. And you can see it brought in all of these images, all 1400. It's combined. There's drone photography. You can see here as well as just standard DSLR photography. And there's also some good information that you're going to want to keep track of and, and look at here. So you can see within each image, you can see that it has imported the camera uh, EXIF data, as well as showing you what the uh, lens was that the picture was captured by. And now that's a good tip when you're using drone photography and DSLR photography, is it's best practice to keep the lensing the same. So you can see here that the majority of my DSLR footage uh, has EXIF data and they were shot on a 28 mil. Now, if you scroll down and we can get to the drone photography and you can see here, I named it uh, these with the tag drone. Basically, you can see as well that those were shot on a 28 millimeter because I was using a Mavic 2 Pro and the standard uh, camera lens on that one is a 28 mil lens. So you will be good to go. Um, now, this little error message here is just because at, the, at this time, the version of Reality Capture that I'm working on just doesn't have that Mavic 2 Prone's lens in their database, but it's not gonna keep you from being able to solve uh, for your point cloud in your scene. So that's our images. And from here, once all of our images are in and we have everything collected, the next step is going to be going over to this alignment. And when we want to actually generate our point cloud using the images that we've just imported, all you have to do is come over here and click align images and it'll start the process of generating that point cloud. Now for sake of time in the webinar today, I'm just going to skip ahead to the actual generated point clouds so that you can see what you'll get out of the gate and then we'll go from there and figure out how we can you know improve upon that solve and get things like the the drone photography and the ground photography in order to get them to mesh into one component you're going to have to use things uh, called control points and now i guess that's a that's a good thing to point out too is any solve that you do with align images is going to create something that reality capture calls components and what components are, are basically, it's a point cloud that's created generating um, the amount of cameras it was able to solve for out of the available images. So basically, it's treating every image like a camera, for lack of a better way to describe it. And if I pull out here, go to scene, and then uh, camera scale, can increase these. And now these, all of these are representative of cameras that created the solve. And all of these cameras are basically just an image that was taken. So you can see the patterns that I used in order to capture all this data is basically the, the number one thing you want to do with photogrammetry is you want to have parallax. And the way that you capture parallax when you're taking photography is you want to take as many photos in concentric circles around the object as possible. And here you can, you can almost literally follow the path that I took, where I took a very, very wide loop around the structure, basically taking an image at intervals of about three feet, two to three feet. Basically, I walked around and I just took a step to the right, fired off an image, took a step to the right, fired off an image. 
and then I uh, pushed in and came closer to the structure and again walked around concentric circles getting closer and closer with each loop to where you know you start out from a wide loop around getting tighter loop around and then also getting up into and on the structure again did many 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 loops around the objects to capture as much data with the most parallax as possible. And now something else that you notice if you look in at these cameras themselves, like for instance, these two guys here, this camera is basically pointed at the corner here, and this camera is pointed at this mullion here. And why taking the images from different angles again are important is even though you're doing concentric circles, you want to change the angle of the camera so that you can get the most data captured as possible. So say, for instance, if we just look at this mullion here, basically the data you want to get from it is uh, thinking about it orthographically. You want a shot that's dead on. You want a shot that's from sort of a, a, a three quarter angle on this side. And then you want to do the same thing, three quarter angle to capture the other side. And then once you get up top into in the top of the structure, then you want to get that other side. And the way that you do that, again, um, as I was taking these photos from concentric circles walking around and around the structure, is basically I would take my camera and I would focus in on just one million, and then I would take a picture, and I would step to the side, take a picture, step to the side, take a picture, basically making the million uh, the focal point of my image for every photo in this concentric loop. Then I would start off at a three quarter angle, make the, the side of this mullion here, the focal point of my image, take a photo, step to the right, make this my focal point, step to the right, take an image, take an image, take an image, and then doing the exact same thing just for the opposite direction, making this side my fo point of focus, photo, point of focus, photo, point of focus. I mean, basically you can almost see exactly where I was taking the photo just by looking at these camera, uh, the representation of the camera. And that's how you're gonna maximize your imagery to get the most parallax so that the reality capture can solve every single nook and cranny, you know, down to the gum on the ground. It has everything as a faithful one-to-one -one recreation of what this object is out there in the world because you've taken a photo of basically every inch of that object and uh, that's gonna help reality capture to solve. So again, walking it back, that's just a little tangent on actually how you take the photography uh, for, for your solve. But getting back to the components, now, as we said, each image that is used, they're considering it a camera. And so what happened here is that basically 1,200 out of 1,400 available cameras were used to create this point cloud. So let's look at this point cloud. So here you can see, this is what is just generated raw. Let me walk this camera scale back a little bit just because we know what the dots are now. We don't need to see them. So this is the point cloud that's generated from using just 1,200 of the available 1,400 cameras. And basically what that means is that this component solved for all of the photography taken on the ground. It did not account for the photography taken by the drones because it didn't understand um, one from the other. It, it only, it saw all of the images from the ground DSLR and it merged all of those into a component. And then if we look down here to uh, this component number three, you can see that this is all the photography and here's all the little camera, uh, camera representations that this is all the drone photography. And so you can see from here, we've got a really good uh, amount of data and the point cloud captured on the top of the structure and the surrounding ground. But if we get a little closer and come from a side angle, it has virtually no information at all about what's inside the structure. And that's because it broke them off into two sections where basically it's like, ah, okay, here's a sequence of images that's from a drone. I solve for this, I make a component. Here's a sequence of images that are from the DSLR. I solve for this. I make a component. 
And then now here on the ground imagery, you can see that it's very thin in terms of resolution on the top of the structure because, you know, down here from the ground, we don't really see uh, the, the roof of this guy. And so that's why we needed the drone to capture the top down and the DSLR to do the heavy lifting down on the ground. But now how do you get these two things to, to merge and work together? How do we get these drone, drone images to sync up and get the point cloud generated with both of them together? And the way that you do that is with control points. And so back here in the alignment tab, you'll see here's control points. So you wanna click on this, and then what you're gonna do is come down to this control points tab, and you're gonna to wanna to hit create. And then what that's gonna do is it's gonna create a point and it'll start out at zero. So in that point, you'll go around and you can see actually here's a point zero right here. I zoom in on this. So right here is a feature that I stuck my point on. And if I get real close, you can see it's basically on uh, the bell portion of the structure. There was a really brightly defined uh, piece of rust corrosion, like basically uh, copper corrosion. And if I scroll through and look at another image, take a second just to resolve for that. Zoom in here. Some of these images are quite large, so it takes a second for the preview to generate. All right, there we go. So now you can see right here, it, it's almost like match moving or if you're tracking in like um, PF track or synthize, something like that. Control points you want to think about is like feature trackers. And you want to lay those down on a, a, a prominent source of con, you know, high contrast, something that is easily visible from close up or far away. And it's a feature that in multiple images, the software will be able to see it and recognize that this is that same point. I'm going to use this as an anchor point to generate my solve. And so if I scroll over here, you can see on the point cloud, you can see this point zero out here on the bell. So if I zoom out again, if I hover over the point, you'll see over here, all of the cameras that that control point essentially merges together. Okay. And so we have, you know, roughly, uh, I don't know, maybe 30, 30 or so images that we have uh, tied to this one control point. And you can see as well, if you focus right here on this P number, this number here is going to be the ratio of accuracy for this point. And now a good control point or a good solve point for your point cloud is going to be well below uh, a, a pixel value of one. So you can see all of these are basically 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. That, this means that this control point that we've chosen, this feature that we've, con we've chosen for our control point, is an excellent source of uh, continuity amongst a number of, of, of cameras. And that's going to help Reality Capture know how to solve for this, for this image. All right, so we see why this is a good feature. And this will help us you know, tie in a bunch of cameras on the ground. Now let's talk about how we were able to get those two components to merge together. How were we able to get that drone imagery to tie in with uh, the ground imagery that we took? And so here, if I come down to actual, the final component, the one that worked, that was really good. If I come down here, and then I go to 0.5. Now you can see that we have cameras from the drone linking up to cameras on the ground. 
And now how this helps us is it allows reality capture to understand that, you know, hey, I've got these drone images and I have these images on the ground. They relate to each other. This is all connected. So I need to take those, all these extra components that I've been making and merge them into one sort of master component that has all of the information. And this one does. Basically, we have a ton of information from our, our ground images getting all up inside the structure. Let me make this a little wider so we can see we get all that detail. I mean, down to like individual slats of wood, every texture detail is one to one recreated. I mean, this is a hundred percent faithful recreation of this exact location uh, out there in the world, even down to the bird poop on the top <laughs> on the day. But so that's how you use control points to solve for your point clouds and to make your components mesh together into something that you can solve for and mesh and then texture. All right, so now that we've gone over how to import our images, how to, how to create our point cloud, let me get back to here, how to create our point cloud using align images and uh, control points, the next thing we wanna do is to reconstruct and create our mesh. So here in the reconstruction tab, um, over here you'll start out with, and there are three options. Um, basically there's preview, normal detail, and high detail. Now preview uh, out of the gate will generate just, you know, just a mesh that you can get the basic massing and blocking and just make sure that, you know, your, your model was created faithfully and there's not areas of uh, low resolution where you didn't take enough images. If uh, you haven't taken enough images, there will be sometimes uh, holes in the mesh, uh, and then you'll have to go back and either try to resolve with more control points to get more data in those areas, or you have to go back and take more pictures on, on wherever that structure was. Um, but the normal detail is really honestly the one that you're gonna wanna use the most because uh, normal detail and high detail, there's you know, the high detail obviously is going to get you more detail, but the speed uh, decrease in high detail is is quite large compared to normal. And when you can get basically 85, 90% of all the detail that you would get from high detail and normal in, you know, less than half the time, you're going to want to use normal detail. I mean, really with these kinds of models, uh, the extra little tiny, tiny bit you would get from high detail you would never notice it really, honestly, after using a bunch of models. Uh, that's, that's one of the great things about reality capture is you don't have to do that high detail because the normal detail out of the box is really, honestly, it's amazing. So what you would do is you want to just hit that normal detail. And what it's going to do is it's going to solve for, uh, for a model. And I have one here. And this is what you're gonna get when you solve for a model out of the gate. Now, right now, uh, it looks, again, like it's uh, there's holes in it and things like that, but that's really just because of the video card of the machine that I'm on uh, in the raw state of the model. I mean, these things will come out massive. Um, for example, like this guy here has uh, almost a billion triangles and the next step of this process is how to refine that enormous uh, point cloud model down into something that's more manageable because you'll, you'll get some, I mean, the, the, the final one that I used here, it ended up being 3 million tries, but it was closer to 2 billion triangles uh, when it actually did its mesh solve. And that thing was enormous and you're not going to use that. So um, this is an actual contiguous solid mesh again, you can see it a little bit better from afar. It's just uh, uh, reality capture is really smart in the way that it parses information onto your video card. So it doesn't bog down your machine and just basically lock you up. If there's an object that is too large, uh, it'll just give you a point cloud representation of it. And so that's what we're looking at here. So from here in reconstruction, what we're gonna wanna do is to decimate this guy, reduce it down. And the way you do that is right here with this simplify tool. So what you do is when you click on the simplify tool, it's going to open up this little menu down here and it's going to give you the ability to give it an exact uh, target to hit 
uh, or you could just go with the default. I mean, basically the default here is going to hit you at about 3 million uh, triangles, and that's a pretty good one uh, to go with. So we'll just do that and, uh, and go from there. So once you simplify that model, it's going to go from the 602 million tries down to about 3 million tries, and you will see next to no difference at all in the mesh itself. And so once you've simplified, then you're going to want to do a couple things. You're going to want to check integrity. And what this is going to do, as it says here, if you hover over, it's going to scan for a corruption in the model. Uh, check topology will make sure that it finds any non-manifold things uh, and, and fill them in. Clean model will actually do that filling in. So the steps that I do is I'll go simplify tool, then I'll do check integrity, check topology, clean model, and if I need to, close holes, but for the most part, these three here will take it uh, all the way. And then once your model has been decimated down, the next thing you want to do is to pull our textures. And before we can pull our textures, we want to create UVs. So go to unwrap. And here in the unwrap parameters, again, this process is super simple. And to be honest, for the amount of uh, definition and just the sheer size of some of these models, Reality Capture pulls some, some pretty good UVs. I mean, in the world of uh, Substance and Mari, where you no longer have to sit there and meticulously, you know, unfold every single object. Uh, we don't live in that world anymore, and I'm happy that we don't. Um, so, but Reality Capture will pull some really, really strong UVs uh, and give you a, a great solve. So the process you go through here is you can set the maximal texture resolution of the textures that you want it to output. So you can go with uh, you know anywhere from 16K, 8K, 4K, down to 2K images. Um, I find that I usually like to either stay in the 16K or 8K range. And then you tell it how many uh, UDIM tiles, basically, you, you want it to have. So instead of throwing all of the texture onto just one UDIM image, uh, you're going to be able to tell it, you know, I want to throw that and parse it out amongst 10 tiles or 12 tiles. And then what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the ratio of the amount of UDIMs that it's created versus the resolution of the texture. And it's going to give you the maximum amount of uh, projection fidelity that it possibly can. It, it runs the algorithm and it says, okay, for 16K maps with 12 UDIM tiles, you're going to get basically a one-to-one -one texture representation of the images that you took. Uh, and it's going to be pretty flawless. So to prove that point, let's come down to this model that we actually did uh, pull the model and the texturing on. So to come down to model three. And we can see here in this area, under our model and then the texturing tab, you can see the count of textures was 17. And basically I pulled uh, 17 UDIM tiles at 16K maps with 16K maps each. And that gave me a 74% texture utilization, but the texture quality was 107%. So basically using only 75% of the images that I took to scan for the model, I was able to get 100% accuracy in terms of the texture reprojection. And so that texture reprojection is again, it's point on, spot on accurate, and it's faithfully recreated every nook and cranny of this object. Again, down to the rust on the bell and the gum on the ground. Everything's recreated one to one, perfect representation. Okay, and so here, I mean, again, you you don't have to use uh, 16K maps. I mean, I, I work in in film and television, so I I want to have you know the highest highest quality maps, but that can be cost prohibitive in terms of disk space being taken and file size. So, you know, this ratio here basically is texture quality. Um, that's the one you want to keep an eye on. So however you work that out with 
more UDIMs and smaller texture resolution or less UDIMs and higher texture resolution, as long as this number here, this texture quality, is at or around 100%, then you know that you've faithfully recreated uh, the images based on the texture, the photo reference that it had to work with. All right, so that's, you know, long and short of it, that's the entire process. And that will give you this one-to-one -one faithful recreation uh, with just super, super accuracy and detail. And, uh, you know, we've summed this up in, you know, 20, 30 minute video, but this whole process all in took about mm, four, four days, like just under four days. And now it could have been a little bit faster, but this one was used doing the high detail. Uh, so it, it would be about half the time just using the normal detail. And you can keep track of the time it took to calculate things by looking down here. So you can see overall processing time of this entire project was three days, 19 hours. The texturing took uh, just under two days and the meshing time took just under or just over a day. So um, the depth math projection itself, essentially the point cloud generation took 17 hours. So all in, you're looking at about uh, a little less than a day to generate the point cloud uh, based off of nearly 1500 images, another day to mesh the object, and then uh, just, just over a day to texture it. So all in, three days, 19 hours, let's round that up and just say that it was four days. Okay, and that's four days to create a faithful one-to-one -one pixel accurate, texture accurate recreation of this structure. And again, four days versus probably the four weeks it would take uh, to have you know a regular post-production process run on something like this, like taking two weeks roughly to model it, another two weeks to texture it. Uh, that's an enormous time savings when you're creating, you know, assets like this, when you need faithful recreations of real phenomenon and places and locations, just the amount of time that reality capture can save you is tremendous. It's just amazing. So again, let me drive home that point one more time. You are looking at four days worth of work versus what it would take in about four weeks to recreate if you just did this by, by hand manually with a, a team of artists. Four weeks, four days. When you multiply that out by, you know, this is just one structure, one object. Say you have 10 of these, say you have 100 of these. The amount of time you're gonna save using photogrammetry and reality capture in, in, in particular, uh, it's, it's just astounding. You'll you'll never want to go back again. I use Reality Capture on all my shows, and I've been uh, <laughs> I've been ringing the bell uh, out there on uh, in my studio and among other studios and friends that I have working. That you, if you're doing any kind of onset data wrangling or or capture, you need to be using photogrammetry and you need to be using Reality Capture. All right. Again, my name is Timothy Hansen. I'm a visual effects supervisor in Los Angeles, California, and I'm the founder of Max Depth TV. You can find a number of tutorials, uh, and specifically one on reality capture, by heading to maxdepth.tv. Thanks.